I'm Dr Catherine Dell and I'd like to speak to you today about creation and ecology from the perspective of biblical wisdom. We're all familiar with the first line of the Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Here then in Genesis 1 we learn the basic biblical premise that God is the creator of the world. The description is of creation by word. God speaks and the world comes into being. The cosmos is an ordered reality, shaped in the face of a threatening chaos. There are immense problems when this account is taken literally. Indeed, modern science quickly shows up its inadequacies. And so even on its own terms, it's probably best taken as symbolic of the religious belief that God created the world. It took ecologist and environmentalist Lynn White Jr., writing in the journal Nature in 1967, to point out that the historical roots of our ecological crisis are to be found in the Judeo-Christian doctrine of creation. He saw these roots as lying in the belief that humans were made in God's image and share in God's transcendence of nature, having dominion, and that the whole natural order was created for the sake of humanity. He basically blamed Genesis for attitudes that have lasted for centuries and wreaked havoc with our planet. Well, in response, we could spend time reinterpreting the Genesis 1 text, as many have done. The biblical scholar James Barr, for example, argued that the evidence from Genesis tends away from a license to exploit and towards a duty to respect and to protect. However, I suggest that we look elsewhere than Genesis for inspiration, to the biblical wisdom literature, Proverbs and Job. Let us turn first to Proverbs 8, that describes God creating the world through a metaphorical female figure of wisdom. Although it's poetry that describes the creation of wisdom, it also gives us an alternative account of creation. God is described as designing and constructing the world, accompanied by wisdom, who delights in God's creation at every stage. The creation is still about restraining chaos, so that here God is described as drawing the circle of boundary on the deep, creating the skies above and restraining and delimiting the chaotic sea. And so we hear wisdom saying, The Lord created me at the beginning of his work. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he assigned to the sea its limit, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. The new aspect here is the expression of a female principle of wisdom through which God is said to have created the world, a principle that is herself created, existing apart from God and able to delight in his created works. Interaction and interrelationship combined with delight and wonder at the world coexist. Chaos is tempered with order and the earth, in all the diversity of its inhabitants, including humans, is determined by its boundaries. Turning to another wisdom book, the book of Job, speeches ostensibly from God himself appearing in a whirlwind describe the acts of creation. Unlike Genesis, the passage describes the wonder and otherness of God's creation, a world that takes account of every kind of creature, it begins with God's questions to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Of course the answer is, 
The god did all of this. As builder, he stretched out a plumb line to measure the earth and took care to put down firm foundations. This time the luminaries that he created are the ones delighting in his work, just as wisdom delighted in God in Proverbs 8. The passage emphasises, as Genesis 1 did, that God needed to prescribe bounds to the chaos that ever threatens to undo the creative act. This time, though, using the image of the sea bursting out from a womb, as a baby does, accompanied by water, and making the point that from the moment it is born it needs restraining. The creation of morning and evening, the expanses of earth and sea, and the boundary gate of death are described. Also the path of wind and rain, floods and lightning, It's even suggested that God makes rainfall in places where there is no human living there to receive it. God uses gratuitous rain to make the desert flower. There is a description of all the animals that God creates. Lions, ravens, mountain goats, wild asses, the ostrich and the eagle, mainly living far from human habitation, but we are told that God cares for them all. The wildness of these animals suggests something untamed and free. They exist and function without any reference to the human world, answerable only to their divine creator. This picture challenges the hierarchical one in Genesis that sees animals as subservient to human beings and takes us beyond the acts of creation themselves towards a more interactive and sustaining view of God's dealing with the world. The emphasis falls on nurturing life in all its forms, even in the desert, the home of snakes and lizards, where there is no rain. How then might these alternative creation traditions relate to our role in caring for our precious planet in all its biodiversity in the present day? Those with an ecological agenda emphasise three principles that I seek to relate to the wider view of creation gained through a brief look at these wisdom passages. First, modern ecologists recognise that nature is characterised by a series of complex interrelated processes and human beings interact with both those processes and with each other. We know that everything is interrelated and vulnerable. One small disturbance on our planet causes ripples elsewhere, whether it be an ecosystem or a human population. From these wisdom texts, we can see that there's a key interrelationship between the divine, the natural world and human beings. God is the creator and sustainer of all things throughout time, not just at a moment in time, so that relationships develop and evolve continuously. A second principle of ecology is the aim of the well-being and flourishing of all human and non-human life in all its richness and diversity. The ancient writers featured here were also clearly aware of the sheer diversity of their world which was small compared to our knowledge of ours. We have conquered whole continents and even other planets and our knowledge of new species and new universes grows every day. Accompanying this for the biblical writers is sheer awe at the intricate workings of nature and at the wonders of creation. A third principle of ecology is recognition of the inherent value of life and the need to sustain it. We know that in order to sustain our planet, We need to keep nurturing life in all its forms, human life and animal life, the diversity of species, protecting endangered species and threatened life forms. From our wisdom texts, this is because God is at the centre and the whole of God's creation has an essential oneness. God is the one who creates and sustains a process that is in the final analysis mysterious. One surprising passage in Job 12 suggests asking the animals about the reality of God's work. Nature itself witnesses to God's presence and work in the world. If that is the case, then we human beings surely 
have to listen hard to nature as we seek to recover the world that is in our care, both for today and for future generations. <laughs>